commentary for chapter four. This is the second of two chapters that look at the macro environment or external environment. In the first one on chapter three, we uh, discussed political, legal, and economic forces. And in this chapter, we look at social and technological forces. Our discussion will begin with social forces. We will develop some examples in food consumption and automobiles. We will then turn our attention to technological forces with a special emphasis on strategy and the internet. And we will close with some comments on a concept called environmental scanning. Now, just as a reminder, macroenvironmental forces affect industries and individual firms within industries. But at this stage, we are looking at the effects on the entire industry, not the firm. So there may be some firm specific examples, but again, the focus is on the entire industry. We'll also note that some categories of forces uh, seem to be more important in some certain industries than others, and that's okay. Maybe social forces drive a particular industry. Maybe it's about technology. The main uh, concern here is to make sure we understand which forces specifically affect the industry. It doesn't matter if one category seems to be more prominent than another. Also, as a quick review, the macro environment includes four areas, political, legal, economic, social, and technological. Often this is referred to as pest analysis. Again, we discussed political, legal, and economic in the previous chapter, and we're talking about social and technological forces in this chapter. So we talk about social forces. A lot of, of issues come to play. Uh, societal values. Uh, what's important in a particular country or in a particular society, uh, whether it's something like free speech or uh, or maybe uh, nationalism that you see, how does that affect particular industries? Uh, what about different trends that occur in social forces? Maybe uh, you might see differences in uh, family size. Families tend to get smaller or have gotten smaller in, in Europe and have sort of leveled off in the United States where the reprodu reproduction rate is somewhere around two or 2.1 per family. What that means is that typically people, the average person if there is, will get, uh, get married and, and have two kids, which just replenishes the population but does not grow it. You see different trends in different parts of the world. Sometimes this is related to uh, religious differences, sometimes to poverty, sometimes to uh, other factors. But looking at trends and how it affects the economy is very important because these trends can change demand patterns. It's kind of a simple way of thinking about it, but if lots of kids are being born, there's going to be a lot of demand for baby diapers and baby food. And certainly if that changes, uh, then as that group moves through the population, you're going to see increased demand uh, years down the road for things like health care and even retirement uh, homes. So we look at things like tr uh, tradition, um, everything from Christmas and the Christmas shopping season, which has such a huge effect on many retailers, especially those that sell a lot of gift type items. And there are traditions outside the United States as well. Alibaba has Singles Day in China. That's been going on since 2009. It's the, the, the greatest or most uh, substantial one day sales event in the world, accounting for $38 billion in sales in 2019 alone, in one particular day, that being November the 11th. Concern for the environment is also a social force as people uh, in different countries are more concerned about the environment. They affect, expect businesses to modify their production uh, procedures and do other uh, things, take other measures in order to uh, be responsible corporate citizens. Now, we talked about some social trends in the U.S. Uh, we mentioned uh, de the declining birth rate, the aging population that really emanates from uh, the baby boom following World War II. So we have a higher percentage of Americans now who are retired than we have in previous uh, previous years. A much more diverse society, uh, diverse uh, meaning individuals from different ethnic backgrounds, country backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Uh, greater emphasis on convenience. Um, even the, the whole notion that we buy a lot of things online is driven by the fact that we can do it much more quickly. Not just cheaper, but it's faster. So convenience is a big issue. It affects industries uh, in you know, restaurant industries in terms of uh, pickup, takeout, drive-throughs. Uh, the use of social media is a, a big trend in the United States has taken hold. That's how people not only communicate, but also how they get their news and other information as well. 
Now, the, the text focuses on two uh, specific areas for exa as examples of social forces. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to look at these in more detail in the text, but just make a few comments here. The first category, uh, we return to the food consumption category. Uh, here we, we see a, a very interesting dichotomy of forces. And on the one hand, uh, consumers are supersizing at record rates. Uh, you know, the notion of, of buying a soft drink and a 32 ounce or 48 ounce size, um, extra, extra large fries with your burgers. Uh, you see this, but on the other hand, you also see an, an interest in healthier eating and gym memberships and, and all of that. So you have an interest in eating healthier and also in consuming more category, uh, calories and fat. So how do, you, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with demand for grilled chicken and at the same time, you know, burgers with bacon and three slices of cheese? I mean, what, what do companies in this industry do? Well, Sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to resolve, uh, but you often see as a niche orientation. So you might see a, a fast food provider, let's say like Hardee's, that says, you know, we're not that concerned with the healthy eating uh, trend, but we're going to put bacon and cheese and, on everything we sell. I mean, that's just the target that we're going, uh, the, the market we're going to target. And then you might see another company like Subway that says, well, our, our focus is going to be on the healthy side. So yeah, you can, you can eat things that are not healthy at Subway, but the emphasis is going to be on those individuals who want to eat healthier. So different companies take different approaches. Maybe McDonald's is, is straddling the fence here, trying to provide salads and wraps and some healthy items at the same time, relying heavily on the Big Macs and fries that has brought that fast food uh, behemoth to its, uh, to its position as number one in the industry. We see that consumers are drinking a lot more bottled water now instead of soda uh, and eating cereal as snacks more rather than for breakfast. So you say, well, there's an interesting uh, you know, tidbit here for those producers of cereal. They're selling the product, but people aren't necessarily buying it for breakfast anymore. So it changes how products are marketed across the board. If we look at the automobiles category, it's very interesting as well from a social force standpoint. Again, we see what appear to be differing trends. I mean, on the one hand, you see a lot of interest in more fuel economy, uh, electric vehicles that don't use uh, you know, gas at all. Uh, you see that interest in safety, but then you also see an interest in big, heavy, bulky SUVs. So how do you produce a big, bulky, heavy SUV that gets super, uh, super high mileage? It's a real challenge. Should you be trying to, to balance these demands in a single vehicle? Should you produce different kinds of vehicles to satisfy consumers that have maybe one category of consumers that is more interested in, in fuel economy and then maybe another category that wants you know, a, a large vehicle? How do you deal with this? This is a real challenge for, for companies in this industry. But if you're operating in this industry, this is something you have to sort out. Well, let's close our discussion of, of social forces by uh, commenting on global concerns. Now, firms in, in, that operate in different countries have to address different sets of social forces. Sometimes the same trend might uh, permeate a lot of different parts of the world. The healthy eating trend, for example, is affecting many parts of the world, but not all of them. Uh, nonetheless, the, you know, the, at the individual firm level, when you do this analysis and you look at how these forces affect, social forces affect your industry, you have to think about it on a country by country basis, sometimes even within the country, maybe difference, uh, different effects in one part of the United States versus another part. Now, social forces are influenced by national culture, which is the generally accepted values, traditions, and patterns of behavior. Uh, now, again, recognizing these is very important, but some firms struggle because their managers consciously refer to their own co cultural values as a standard of judgment. This is a natural thing that we all do. So if you were raised in the West, you think that it's just right to eat with a fork and a knife, and it just feels strange or unusual to try to eat with chopsticks. If you're raised in the East, well, you eat with chopsticks and you don't understand why people need to eat with forks and knives. It's just a natural sense of upbringing. And at some point we realize that it really doesn't matter how you eat, these are just regional preferences or different parts of the world doing things differently. One way is not better than another or the right way or the wrong way. 
but we have to train our minds to look at this a little differently uh, because the self-reference criterion is at work and we have a tendency to think that the way we do it is always the right way. Now there may be things that we do that are right and maybe some other cultures are not correct uh, and that's fine, but there are a lot of things we do that are just different. So let's shift our attention to technological forces and here we look at things like scientific improvements, innovations, and the internet is arguably the most pervasive technological force that affects most industries. Now, if we think about why the internet is important or how it's reached that prominence, let's go back to a book written by Thomas Friedman in 2005. And it really made a, a good argument for how all this occurred because you had a dot-com bubble in the late 1990s, a lot of new uh, companies going online. They were, they, they were convinced that that just being online was going to be profitable. Many of them fell apart though. And during this time, you had telecommunications firms laying fiber optic cables across the oceans to connect the United States with China and India. And these were part of massive investments going on. Well, a lot of the companies doing that went bust, but uh, the cables were still there and they provided high quality, low cost contact with developing na uh, nations. And this leveled the playing field in a lot of ways. Uh, years ago, several decades ago, if you made a phone call from the United States to India, you would pay several dollars an hour, or I'm sorry, several dollars a minute. Today, you could just make it by internet at no charge, and that's because these cables are there. Now, these same cables transmit lots of other information at virtually no cost. There is a cost, but it's very low. And what that does is it allows companies in different parts of the world to compete uh, through across the ocean in other nations. And for this reason, a lot of Indian companies compete uh, in information-based uh, industries in the United States and other uh, parts of the Western or Western parts of the world. Now, there's a great quote in this book, and that is, this came from an, uh, someone other than the author. It says, any activity that can be digitized and moved around will get moved around. So in other words, if you're selling a product that has to be shipped, well, it has to be shipped. So there are certain issues that you, you have to consider in terms of location. But if you're producing a service or if you're producing something that uh, does not have to be shipped, if you're making music, you don't have to ship a CD or any type of physical good. It can be transmitted in electronic form. Then that's going to ultimately be transmitted in the way that is the least expensive, the, mo uh, the most efficient. Another way of looking at this is if, if you can get technological uh, support, tech support services from somebody in India, well, they can provide them now. That's it. Why not have somebody in India uh, conduct their, or perform that service uh, instead of paying somebody in the U.S. Uh, at, a, at a higher rate? Uh, that, that type of service can be digitized. It's something that's transmitted electronically, so it will get moved around, and not just to India, but to any part of the world that is connected and can, can provide that service most efficiently. And we see digital competition has really increased ever since that time. So how does the internet affect strategy? Does the internet uh, always create new business models or just change the old ones? There's a bit of a, a debate here. Uh, certainly there's some industries we can see that popped up because of the internet. Certainly online auctions would be a great example and, and others have been affected substantially uh, by the internet. But at the same time, Michael Porter, uh, who, who is responsible for the, the five forces analysis, makes an interesting point, uh, did this years ago, and he said, you know what, the internet has a lot, has a great impact on, on industries and, and how business is done, but ultimately, um, you still have to have a customer and you still have to make a product, you have to, to sell it at a price people are willing to, to, to pay. There, there are certain parts for the business transaction that simply are not changed by the internet. The internet can have a big effect but it doesn't change everything. So even if people are visiting your website, uh, that's great, but it's not the same as buying your product. You still have to sell products and pay your expenses to make money. Something to keep in mind as we think about the importance of the internet. There's also a process called disaggregation and reaggregation. This is one of the more complex uh, uh, points in the entire book, so you have to, to think closely as you, you consider it. And here the idea is that large firms exist because they can perform most of the tasks uh, involved, whether it's uh, procuring raw materials, producing a product, hiring people, selling the product. 
So the idea is you have a large firm that exists because they can do everything most efficiently. And we saw a lot of this 100 years ago as companies got bigger and bigger and started doing everything under one roof. Um, but what we see now is that a lot of firms have, have shifted their attention. A lot of firms don't do everything under one roof. They actually farm out pieces of it to partners or other companies that do those parts more effectively. So they have, uh, you, you may actually even have a company that sells a product but doesn't even make the product. Make the main, perhaps they don't even see the product. It's made by a company in another country and shipped directly to customers without that, the, the, the branding company even seeing the particular product. That's because somebody else can produce it more efficiently and effectively and someone else can distribute it more effectively. So the idea here is that w the, the, the previous trend toward doing everything uh, under one roof as one single company, the idea that that was most efficient has changed. And that's been driven by technology and more specifically by the internet. The internet allows for that exchange of information so it makes it much more convenient and cost uh, effective for a company to work with partners to, to carry out a lot of the activities that are required. So we call this disaggregation and reaggregation because what this means is that the large companies have disaggregated by, because they quit doing certain parts of the business they used to do because it's not efficient anymore and they've now reaggregated by adding partners. They work closely with other companies to provide those specialized uh, uh, activities. It's not uncommon to see a large company uh, work with human resource firms to do a lot of their hiring and firing and employee testing. Uh, they work with marketing firms to create advertising and, and ad campaigns. Uh, they, they work with uh, certain suppliers to produce many of their products. They work with shippers sometimes to not just move products around, but if you have a warranty uh, claim, the, the shipper might even have someone fix the product and return it to the customer without even shipping it to your uh, facility. So there are lots of partners doing lots of things that used to be done um, in, in done centrally by the company. And we call this process or this change disaggregation and reaggregation. It really explains uh, a lot of how, uh, how the internet affects strategic management. What are the strategic dimensions of the internet? And there are five ways we can, we can think through this. I mean, the internet has influenced strategy in very specific ways. Um, the early expectations was that Company, the internet would make all companies more profitable. It never works out that way because as companies you know, get involved in any type of technology, it always seems to balance out. So we see that the internet in many ways has favored consumers, not, uh, not firms. So the first way the internet has changed strategy has been the movement toward information symmetry. Now, in typical markets, you have what we call information asymmetry. And this is the idea that sellers have information that buyers don't have. So sellers know what will know what it costs to produce a product. They know uh, all the ins and outs. They know what's wrong with the product. You know, if you buy a used car from, from a, a car dealership, presumably that dealer knows what might be wrong with it. So there's a difference in information. But the internet has actually closed that gap. Now there still are instances where there's differences in, there are differences in information, but the, uh, the gap again is much smaller than it used to be. Uh, and using the car example, let's say you're going to buy a new car. You can go online and see exactly what the dealers pay uh, for their new cars, what kind of incentives are there, what kind of promotions. All that information is available online. So as a buyer, you can have the same information that the seller has. In fact, in many cases, you may know more than the sales rep knows when, when you're negotiating the price for a vehicle. The second change that the internet has had on strategy is the use of the internet as a distribution channel. Now, for many goods and services, um, the internet can distribute that product for you. Think about things like airline tickets, or insurance, or stocks, or computer software. Decades ago, this used to be distributed physically. If you bought an airline ticket, they mailed you a ticket. If you bought shares of stock, they sent you certificates for the shares of stock. If you bought software, you bought a package, opened it up, brought it home and installed it on your machine. Today, a lot of this, in fact, most of it, is distributed electronically. So if you're in one of those industries where the, the, the products and services can be digitized, 
Well, this is, is huge for your particular industry. It changes how everything works. The third dimension is speed. Um, the internet obviously speeds up the transaction and a lot of processes that lead up to it and follow it. I mean, communication, uh, again, decades ago occurred through mail or sometimes through phone, but the, the whole notion of emailing someone and texting and chats and so forth create, creates an instantaneous exchange of information. It increases the speed of the transaction. Interactivity is another issue as well because consumers can discuss their experiences with products and services on bulletin boards and chat rooms. They can, they can text uh, back and forth, use social media. Uh, firms can really readily exchange this information with trade associations that represent their industry. So there's a lot of interactivity, way to connect with other people online that did not exist before the internet. And finally, and perhaps the most critical dimension is the potential for, for cost reductions and cost shifting. The operative word here is potential. The internet provides many businesses with opportunities to minimize their costs uh, and, their, and thereby enhance flexibility. But just because it decreases cost doesn't necessarily mean it's more effective. A good way of thinking about this is uh, advertising. If you're going to mail an ad to somebody, you have to package up a, an advertiser or a flyer and send it to somebody through the mail. It arrives physically in their mailbox. This is obviously costly. Now, if you send an email to somebody, if you have them on your mailing list, one click and there it goes to a million customers, virtually cost-free. Well, you might say, well, clearly we want to email our advertisements. The problem, of course, is that many of those emails are never read. They end up in spam folders and people get so many emails they just don't pay attention anymore. So just because it's cheaper doesn't mean it's more effective. Well, let's close our discussion of, of the technology with two trends that really bring together technology and the social forces. And these are commoditization and mass customization. Commoditization is the idea that firms are having a more difficult time distinguishing their products and services from rivals. And you see this frequently because uh, the, the characteristics of different products are so complicated, it's just overwhelming. Uh, if, for example, if you go do a search for eyeglasses online, uh, you, you, you'll see a website that might offer a thousand different frames. How do you make sense of that as a consumer? It's very difficult. Often what consumers do, what buyers do, is they simplify, they break it down, they say, uh, based on price or two or three features where this is the, you know, maybe a brand I know, this is what I'm going to buy. And this is called commoditization. It's just the fact that it's so difficult to distinguish your product that consumers often don't even pay attention to all the details anymore. It's just too much on their plate to sort out. Now, mass customization is a little bit different and it's the ability uh, to individualize product or service offerings that meet specific buyer needs. Amazon has been the master at mass customization. The idea traditionally was that if you try to serve lots of people, you have to have you know, a one-size-fit-all approach that detracts from service. Amazon has shown us and others have followed and demonstrated that this doesn't have to be the case. In fact, when you buy a product online, there's really nobody on the other side observing that purchase, but there are different algorithms that look at what you're searching for in your purchase history, and they might make suggestions and move you in different directions as if they are a real person having a real relationship with you, the customer. And this is the whole notion here. Technology has enabled firms to engage in mass communication. It's, it's, as the internet has developed, you're able to go online and feel like you're getting better service than you might be getting from an individual in a traditional store. Well, let's close our discussion uh, in this entire chapter on the concept of environmental scanning. This is a technical term we use sometimes uh, that refers to the systematic collection and analysis of information that's related to the macro environment, the external environment. In other words, how do we collect all this information? We've just talked about four categories of forces. How do we stay up to date on what's going on in the political, legal, economic, social, and technological arenas? that whatever we do is called environmental scanning. And to some, it's very simple. It's just a matter of watching business news and reading the Wall Street Journal. To, to those in a lot of large companies, they'll have an entire staff that collects information, constantly trying to provide uh, trend information to strategic managers. 
Um, in the past, the, the, the complexity was uh, was associated with getting information. I mean, sometimes it was hard to, to even find market share information or learn about trends and how those trends were affecting your industry. It's still the case in a lot of emerging uh, countries. You, if you're operating in, in less developed or undeveloped nations in the world, you don't have data that just tells you what the trends are socially or or you know what kind of regulations are, are coming down the pike. Things happen in a way that's much less predictable. But in the West today and in developed parts of the world, uh, sometimes the problem is just having too much information. If you do a quick Google search on a common industry, uh, such as the two we discussed in this chapter, maybe fast food, restaurants, or food consumption, or, uh, or automobiles, you'll see just a lot of information just on Google without even looking at proprietary uh, sites. So just sorting that information could be very difficult. And the real challenge is making sense of all of it uh, because too, more information is not always better. Sometimes less is more. What are the benefits of a formalized environmental scanning program? By that, I don't necessarily mean having a staff, but just thinking consciously about how you're going to do this. Well, it increases the general awareness of environmental changes. I mean, if you're paying attention to what's going on, it's going to make you more aware and, and you'll be uh, be in a position to make better uh, strategic uh, plans and strategic decisions. Uh, it also provides greater effectiveness in governmental matters and, uh, and even more effective diversification and resource allocation decisions. So it makes sense to be involved in environmental scanning. To take this seriously. This is not just something you do when it's time to create a strategic plan. Actually, this should be something that's ongoing. You should always be trying to obtain uh, information and keep uh, stay up to speed with what's going on in each of these categories as it affects your firm and or your industry and ultimately your firm. So this uh, brings us to case analysis steps seven and eight and these are the last two steps for the macro environment. These look at social and technological forces. Now here you identify the specific social uh, forces those being step seven and technological forces step eight that affect your industry. And just like we talked about in steps uh, five and six, the emphasis here is precision. Don't just list issues. We want to talk specifically how these issues affect your industry. The focus is not on the firm. Again, we'll get to the firm later, but you really want to provide a detailed assessment of how these fact factors affect your industry. Well, this uh, concludes our coverage of chapter four.